Welcome everyone. Welcome to the third of our uh, Unionville High School uh, college planning webinars. Uh, we'll get started here in a few minutes as we have some of the participants pouring in. Welcome everyone, I'm Bob Fendora. I'm one of the school counselors at Unionville High School. Um, I'll be help, helping to facilitate and host this, uh, the third, the, our third edition this, this year of our uh, Unionville High School college planning webinars. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We'll give it another minute or two uh, as we have more participants joining us as I speak here. Um, thanks again for joining us, I appreciate it. All right, everyone, give it just another minute here. We'll get things started. Okay. All right, perfect. We're, we're gonna kick things off here. Um, I know a lot of you, I can see some of the participants popping in. Um, I really appreciate all of you joining us tonight. These uh, webinars that we've been doing uh, have been receiving some, some very positive feedback and uh, I really appreciate um, the community members reaching out to us and, uh, you know, really, really being able to, to, to provide feedback on, on how we run these things and, um, you know, some of the things the community is looking for when it comes to college planning. Um, we have a wonderful, wonderful turnout here uh, tonight and uh, we have some great topics and some great presenters. A very different webinar compared to what we've done in the past, our previous two. Um, tonight's topics are going to be uh, discussing the ROTC and the academies uh, with Commander uh, Dave Augustin. And we have um, athletic uh, recruiting, um, we'll end up being the second portion of our presentation here uh, with Tom Kovic. Okay, he's been helping us out for years uh, with athletic recruiting. And then lastly, we'll be discussing the uh, PASHI uh, state school system. And uh, we have Griffin Jackson uh, from Westchester University Admissions uh, joining us tonight. Um, just so all of you know out there, um, when it comes to the, um, just so all of you know out there, when it comes to the, <clears throat> the webinar here, um, I know this is the first time for some individuals from our community, and I just want to be very clear. Um, we cannot see any of you out in the uh, participants, out, out in the public, out in the community. Uh, we cannot see you. We cannot hear you. Um, we are in a panelist mode is what they call it here through Zoom, um, where we will be presenting uh, throughout the night. This, um, this webinar will be recorded, okay? We'll, we will post it within a week on our Counseling Center webpage, okay? Um, you can jump in, hop in, uh, you can jump out if you need to uh, at any point and, and join us. Um, the big portion of this panelist uh, portion of things for the webinar, our, our, our format, um, the big portion of that is that uh, you as community members, uh, students and parents, and, and we've really had a lot of community members take advantage of this. You have the ability at the bottom of your screen to hit the uh, chat button and uh, ask questions uh, directly to our presenters tonight um, on the different topics. Um, and you'll be able to see that as the questions come in, um, the presenters will present for about 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes on their different topics. As they're presenting, um, I'll be keeping an eye on some of the questions that come in. And as they start to wrap things up uh, with their presentation, um, I'll be able to ask some of the questions to our presenters at the end of, the, end of each session, um, again, for the different topics. Uh, so it, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, I'd like to give a couple of thanks here tonight. First and foremost, thanks to our presenters. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, everyone's going to be presenting on the different topics. Um, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to hold these different webinars, uh, taking time out of their night and their very busy, busy schedules to be able to meet with us. Um, I would also like to thank Justin Webb. He's our, our tech guru at the, uh, at the school district at Unionville here. Um, Justin uh, spearheads a lot of these webinars and takes care of all the technology, uh, which makes things very, very uh, easy for me as a, as a person that's involved uh, with the webinars and also as for our presenters too. And I'd also like to thank Colleen Miller. Uh, Colleen Miller is one of our uh, school counselors. Um, she will actually be helping facilitate some of the chat, some of the questions that come in um, throughout the night with our presenters too. Um, and, and last, I'd like to thank all of you in the community. Um, again, we've received tremendous feedback, uh, you know, for these different webinars. And, and, I, and it's always impressive talking to the, to the different representatives from the different institutions and programs uh, they're always so impressed with the questions that our community asks and, and really how, how detailed they are and astute they are to, to some of the process. Um, and this is a, just another wonderful opportunity, okay? Um, so you'll see throughout the course of the presentation here tonight, 
we will actually have, if you check in the uh, chat right now, you will actually have um, a, um, a, a link to uh, provide feedback uh, throughout the course of the night. So we always appreciate any feedback from community members uh, helps us to kind of make adjustments and, and kind of uh, tweak things a little bit from each of the different webinars and especially from year to year as we make pretty major changes each year when it comes to these webinars as this is the second year that we're doing these, okay? Um, so to get things started here, to get things started, like I said, for those that came in a minute or too late, feel free to utilize the chat at the bottom uh, to be able to ask some questions to our presenters throughout the night. Um, but to get kick things off here, I'm gonna introduce our, our first uh, presenter and he will be presenting on the ROTC and the academies. Um, I have Commander Dave Augustin here. Um, he's joined us in the past. I'm very, very fortunate to work with Dave for years. Um, I do always kind of joke with our community about this. Um, you know, Dave technically, you know, is affiliated with, with the Navy and, and, uh, and uh, his affiliation, but I have to be honest, over the years, um, there's very few questions I've been able to bounce off of Dave that he, he, he did not know. Um, he does a wonderful job just giving a, a nice overview of what the ROTC kind of programs, the basics of what they look like, and even the academies. And so we always appreciate having him back and being able to, to provide our community with some specifics on that topic. Because again, we do have a number of students um, that constantly have questions about both. Uh, so Dave's been a wonderful resource for us. So, so Dave, I'm going to kick things over to you. If you don't mind, Dave, just give a little bit of background about yourself to our community here, just in case we have some newcomers, and, and then feel free to jump right into your presentation, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again for the uh, introduction, Bob. I, I always appreciate um, this opportunity to speak with, uh, with young men and women in the, in the school district. I, um, so my name is Dave Augustine. I'm a blue and gold officer or an admissions representative for the Naval Academy. Um, I live locally in Kennett Square. My kids attend Unionville Elementary, so I do have a special, this, this uh, you know, uh, session has a special place in my heart. Um, I uh, commissioned from the Naval Academy in 2002, served seven years on active duty as a submarine officer. Um, the last 13 years I've been in the reserves and, uh, and my role as an admissions liaison officer is really to help um, be a reliable source of information about the Navy, the Naval Academy, or those that are interested. Now tonight I'm going to be covering both service academies and ROTC. I'm going to try, I, I will present some specific information about the Naval Academy and Navy ROTC, but a lot of the information translates to all service academies. If you have any questions, I can certainly answer those or at least point you in the, in the right direction. Great, thanks Dave, appreciate it. Thank you very much, that's great. My pleasure. All right, so I do have a, a presentation to, to share with you. So please let me know if you can, um, you know, when we're good to go here. Yep, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Looks good. Yep. Great. So, um, so who are we? First, I'm going to start with the service academies, All right, The service academies are the um, five federally funded colleges that are located throughout the country um, where you are obligated some service after you attend these schools. So you can commission to the Army if you go to West Point, Coast Guard, which is located in New London, Connecticut, if you go to the Coast Guard Academy, Air Force Academy, which is located in Colorado Springs, or the Merchant Marine Academy located in Kings Point, New York. Um, I should mention about the Merchant Marine Academy, it is unique in that you can go into any branch of the service upon commissioning, you get a choice um, whether you wanna go into the Merchant Marine or commission into one of the armed services. Okay. And then for the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, you will commission as a Naval officer or as a Marine Corps officer. So what are these schools? So first, they are the undergraduate and commissioning programs of, the, of, of our country. Um, and my information here will, will focus specifically on Navy. Um, but again, this is very, this is the same information across um, Army, Air Force, um, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marine. They are all four-year colleges. You will graduate with a Bachelor of Science. And that's because the core curriculum um, requires a lot of um, math, science, and engineering courses. So you will graduate with a Bachelor of Science. Case of the Naval Academy, there are 25 different majors. Most of them focus on STEM, although we do have humanities and social sciences majors as well. And then there are internship opportunities uh, throughout the course of your four years uh, at, at the undergraduate uh, level so that you can um, focus on a specific area. Um, so the benefits, it's a full scholarship to attend a service academy. That includes tuition, room, board, meals, medical, dental coverage. Everything is paid for by the by the government. In fact, you get paid to go there. You earn a monthly stipend, um, and you're, but you won't see all of that money right away. A lot of this money goes towards paying for things like your uniforms and, um, uh, and other services that you receive while you are at a service academy. 
Now, you are exposed to a lot of training over your summers. So your summer actually, um, typically there are about two months worth of training associated with your, with your summers between your academic years. Um, and that helps so that you can learn what area or what um, community you want to commission into upon graduation. When you graduate, you're commissioned as an officer. So at the Naval Academy, you could commission in the Navy or the Marine Corps. You have a minimum five-year service commitment, and you can go into a variety of different communities. So taking the Naval Academy as an example, you can go into the surface warfare community, you can fly planes in the aviation community, special warfare, which is our Navy SEALs, submarines like myself, or you could go into the Marine Corps. There are always some um, what we call restricted line communities that you can commission into. Typically, these require some sort of um, either a, a waiver or some additional qualifications. So if you wanted to go into the medical corps, you can become a, a doctor going to one of the service academies, but you do have to um, qualify for them. Um, here are a list of different majors at the Naval Academy. Again, they are uh, primarily focused on STEM, but we do have humanities and social science majors. Um, there are a number of available minors as well. About 65% of the class will, will major in something in the first two columns, 35% in that third column. Athletics plays a huge role at service academies. So the physical mission is one that is, is very important uh, across your four years there. You either will compete in a varsity club or intramural sport. At the varsity level, um, so Navy, West Point, and Air Force all compete at the Division I level. Um, for Coast Guard and Merchant Marine Academies, they compete at the Division III level. Uh, club sports are very similar to uh, regular varsity sports. They're just not sanctioned or governed by the NCAA. So these are competitive sports. Teams will travel across the, the country to play. And if you don't compete at the varsity or club level, then you will participate in intramurals. There are multiple seasons um, where you compete against the, uh, the student body. Uh, it's a pretty fun, um, pretty fun opportunity. And those again are required if you are not a varsity or club athlete. So let me get into the application a little bit. All right, there are things that the candidate has to do and then things that the school will assist with. So from the candidate perspective, they'll have to complete a, uh, an online application and included in that is gonna be things like your, your um, personal data, uh, you'll, you will have to take a candidate fitness assessment or physical fitness test. You're going to list out all the extracurricular activities. You do have to have an interview with, um, in the case of Navy, with your blue and gold officer. Army, Air Force, they have a, a similar uh, process as well. And then uh, the candidate does have to provide some additional information um, that, that, the, uh, that will be used by the, by the high school to um, submit documents. So in this case, they will have to submit the English and math teacher recommendations, um, and then a, a guidance counselor typically will verify things like their extracurricular activities, their candidate information, they'll submit the high school transcript, and then the official SAT scores, which you can have sent um, directly from the testing agencies. There is no application fee. Now, one thing that I want to highlight is this nomination um, piece. Okay, so for the service academies, not only are you applying for the school, but in order to um, to receive an offer of appointment, you have to have a nomination by either the congressional representative of your district, state senator, the vice president. Um, these applications, there are separate applications uh, in, that you have to complete. Each office has slightly different requirements. So I wanna highlight that piece because it's a, it is key that you are applying for a nomination in parallel with applying to the school. The only school, the only service academy that does not require a nomination is the Coast Guard Academy. So typically here's how the process will work. About 16,000 or so applicants will start the process, which is starting the, the application online. About 12,000 of those will officially be candidates that they've met some minimum requirements. And, and then we will have, there are four things that you need in order to compete for an offer of appointment. The first is that you have to pass the admissions board. And this is what's looking at your grades, the extracurriculars, all of the, um, the sports uh, that you play, any leadership roles that you have. You then have to pass the physical fitness test. You have to qualify medically. And then the, um, the last piece is obtain that nomination. If you have all four of those elements, you could compete for an offer of appointment. So in this case, of, of the 12,000 or so that start the process, only about 3,400 will meet all four of those requirements. And then of that 3,400, 
only 1,100 or so will receive an offer of appointment. Um, I'm very proud to say that one of the uh, Unionville students this year, uh, a candidate, Dylan Huffman, has received an offer of appointment and will be um, attending Annapolis uh, starting in, in July. So very, sorry, sorry. Uh, very so proud Dave, of Dave, I'm very proud of the Unionville community there. Dave, I'm sorry, to, Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I take full, full credit for all of Dylan's accomplishments as his school counselor. <laughs> but no, thank you. Yeah, you, you were wonderful in helping with assist in the process. So thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. No, no, my, my pleasure. I mean, that's something that the community should be very proud of. Absolutely. Um, you know, it yep. does take a, a lot of, you know, it takes the entire community to help, um, you know, a student get through this process. So yep. very proud of Dylan. Um, one of the things, if you aren't offered an, an appointment, there are some other routes that the admissions board may offer. Um, so in the case of the Naval Academy, we do have a prep school in Newport, Rhode Island. They may offer that to you, or we also partner with 16 civilian and military prep schools throughout the country. And that is offered for some, uh, for some students as well. Um, so the advice for admissions here, uh, I would say is having a strong foundation in math and science. You, you have to take um, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and, and at least the calculus. Um, they will want to see chemistry and physics uh, with a lab as well. There is no minimum GPA, but, though you do want to strive to be in the top 20% of your class. There is no minimum SAT or ACT, though I would say to be competitive, you want to, see, you want to have at least a 1350 on the, on the SAT or a, a 30 on your ACT. All scores are super scored, so you want to take it as many times as possible until you achieve that perfect score. So if you do better on, say, uh, one portion of the ACT and one portion on the SAT, they will take those best scores so that you have the highest score possible. Um, AP, honors, IB courses are highly encouraged, and then well-rounded. We're not necessarily looking for uh, the, the student that does a ton of extracurricular activities, but one that um, has demonstrated leadership uh, potential in those in whatever activity that they choose and that could be athletic or non-athletic so I did mention that the physical mission is an important part of life at, at a service academy and we're seeing about 90 to 95 percent of the student body have participated in varsity athletics two things that I want to call out specific to the Naval Academy um, which these are still uh, available for you to apply if you are a junior current junior um, you can apply for the for the summer seminar. This is a, a week long camp that occurs um, starting in June. That application ends on March 31st. And then for those that are um, freshmen and sophomores, they uh, can apply for the summer STEM program. And this is uh, open again until March 31st. These are two great opportunities to spend some time down in down in Annapolis. Okay, I'm going to transition over to ROTC. And, um, and I'll run through this real quick and then we can answer questions at the end. So ROTC is another fantastic opportunity to commission into the military uh, and receive a top education, fully paid for by the government. There are, um, you can commission into the Army, Navy, Air Force, or the Marine Corps. So there is no um, Coast Guard or Merchant Marine ROTC. So these um, Reserve Officer Training Corps programs are to help prepare students for careers in the military and give them um, those leadership skills to, to have a successful military career. There are over 1,700 colleges across the country that offer ROTC programs. And um, you do have to, look, not all schools offer um, each ROTC program. So you do have to look specifically at the school and which program they do offer. Um, you, the, the scholarships themselves, they are full tuition. To, uh, to the college or university. And there are multiple different types of scholarships available. So there are four year scholarships, three year, two year. So even if you don't get a scholarship in that first year, you can still apply and get scholarships for those additional, um, for, for the years that you remain uh, at the undergraduate level. So it, the uh, scholarship also covers all fees, a stipend for your textbooks. Um, they do provide uniforms. And then there is a summer training element to ROTC as well. So very similar to the service academies with ROTC, you will spend a portion of your summer um, training so that you can determine what community you wanna commission into after graduation. Um, you do receive a subsistence allowance each um, academic month as well. Things that are not covered by the ROTC scholarship. Um, so if the, if the program that you're in is going over four years, they won't cover those additional years. 
Uh, they do not cover medical or dental insurance or room and board. Though some colleges may offer that as a, as a benefit, um, it's just not covered by the scholarship itself. There's some other uh, stipulations. Certainly if you withdraw from the program or if you don't meet the, um, the eligibility requirements, they can uh, withdraw you from the program. So a, a bunch of different requirements to get in. All of these are outlined online. I'm just gonna highlight a few. So the SAT, ACT, you can see um, the scores are, th these are actually posted. So the, uh, the scores that you need to, to achieve in order to be eligible for the scholarship, you can see 1100 combined um, and uh, or 540 math, 550 verbal. Um, but it does, you do have to be uh, at 1100 combined. And you can see the ACT score that as well, 21 math, 22 English uh, combined 44. Um, and the, uh, your GPA minimum of uh, 2.75. They do require that you have one year of calculus, one year of physics, uh, at least uh, a year of English and uh, one, so the, this is the, the academic uh, requirements while you're in the program. So you still have to, regardless of what you major in, you still have to take calculus, you still have to take physics. Um, and that is because of the technical nature of the communities that you will go into. You will have a national security um, or American military affairs course. And, uh, and then there are military science courses that you will have to take specific to what branch of service you're going into. Some of these are eligible for college credit. Um, some may not be. You typically also have to um, do a weekly drill or instruction period. Basically one day a week, you will have to wear the uniform and you would meet as a battalion. And then as I mentioned, you will have a four to six week training period each summer. The service requirement is slightly different for the, uh, the different branches. So you do have to look specifically at which branch you're applying for. M most of them are a minimum of four years of active service. Uh, in the case of the Air Force, they do have a 10-year um, service requirement if you go on to be a, uh, a pilot. Um, for the, the uh, Army, it's a minimum of four years of active duty. Same with the uh, Marine Corps. The Navy requirement is the same as the Naval Academy, which is a five-year active um, service requirement. And, um, and then there are some additional options within ROTC or other communities that you can go into. So in this case, they have a, a requirement if you go into the nursing corps, uh, and that is a, a four-year requirement if you go into the Navy Nurse Corps. All right, so I, I blew through that information pretty quickly, um, but I wanted to turn that over to, uh, yeah, to no, you, the yeah, attendees. Hey, hey, hey thanks a lot. I, I, no, yeah, I, I appreciate that. We, we, we have a couple here before we uh, kind of get things moving over to, uh, to Tom for uh, the athletic recruiting. I, I appreciate, Dave. Um, hey, listen, the uh, first one, a lot of our students that we work with, and I, I speak for this, you know, for doing this for years with, with our community, they kind of, they start to get, they really get hung up on the, the nomination portion of things. And I know that can look different for, some, it's a little bit different for, um, you know, each of the applications and some of the, the different academies, but um, can you speak to any complications you've seen with that process with the nominations as far as, you know, any recommendations you would give while <laughs> students are asking for nominations? And I know at certain points, almost like you have to live in a certain area for some things and other things it's not, right? So, so if you don't mind, if you get anything, you can give, you give feedback on that. Uh, the, that'd be great. The nomination piece is maybe the most confusing piece of <laughs> applying to a service academy. All right. Sure. So it's, don't feel bad if you have questions about it. So sure. Two separate things, right? So there are recommendations, letters of recommendation that you can get that you are required from the uh, from your math um, instructor and an English instructor. Yep. The nomination is an actual service that our uh, elected representatives have to provide. Uh, if you go to their website, you will see what is required for them uh, in order in order to receive that nomination. Yep. Um, there are, it is by district, right? So some folks live um, in district six in our school district. I think some live in district five. Um, and so you are applying to the congressional representative of the district in which you reside, where your home is. You should definitely apply to both state senators and apply to the vice president. Um, it's, they each have slightly different requirements, um, but uh, by and large, people have been able to, to navigate the process. Um, sure. I'd say successfully. Start early. That's the best thing that I can um, that I can advise. You can go on their websites right now. You can see what's required, when the open period is to start submitting the um, the required elements, and when the cutoff is. The cutoff for nominations is sooner than the cutoff for applying to the service academies themselves. Yep. So typically, 
service academies will continue accepting applications until the end of January, mm. but nominations will have to be sometime uh, before the end of October, maybe mid-November. Perfect. Yeah, that, that was perfect. I explained that. Great. Very, very detailed. Thank you. And just one last question before we move over to Tom here. Um, do you do you have uh, do, you, do you apply for the talking about the ROTC scholarship you mentioned before? Do you apply for the ROTC scholarship before or after you apply for admission to that particular school? What would you yeah, say? Great for question. That? So you want to apply in parallel to that. OK. And, and the reason is because um, you, you want to have you don't want to wait until you're accepted to the university before you then see if you can get a, a, an ROTC scholarship to that school. Sure. So you apply to both of them in parallel. Um, ideally, what the, what you will do is list the preference of colleges and universities that you want to attend on that application. Um, it, but but that's so you do want to do them both at the same time. Do not do them in series. Again, the sooner you apply, the better, uh, the more success you will have in getting that uh, four year scholarship. Perfect. Perfect. Well, listen, Commander Dave Augustine, I appreciate your time year in and year out. Do, do such a thorough job. And I, I really appreciate it. And, and Dave, I have to say, um, you, you know, like I said, I really appreciate you fielding questions for, from our counseling department on all, top, all types of topics that come all over the place and even being helpful with, uh, you know, kind of the process, how it looks as an overview to, to different uh, different uh, military academies and ROTCs outside of just the Navy. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, big, big help. OK, Absolutely. Um, so that, so, so, and if anybody does have any questions that they didn't have answered tonight, please, Bob and Colleen both have my um, my contact information and don't hesitate to reach out to me. Perfect. Perfect. Th thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so everybody, we're going to, we're going to uh, kick things over to uh, Mr. Tom Kovic. Tom, we've been, we've been working together for years. I, I appreciate, um, you know, you joining us tonight and talking about athletic re recruiting. And I, I feel the same way, uh, Tom, about you. I feel like, you know, sometimes we get to some tens of community questions uh, year in and year out about athletic recruiting. Tom, um, if I'm not mistaken, you're over with uh, Victory Recruiting um, and, uh, you know, I've been doing this for years. So, so if you don't mind just giving a, you know, a brief background about yourself and, and, and you know, some of your experiences, and then we can kind of jump into some of your points that you might be able to bring up uh, to our, yeah. our community about uh, athletic recruiting, and, and we'll kind of filter through some of the questions as they come in, Tom. Sure, Bob, and thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's great to be back. Um, uh, yeah, so basically my, my, my background is um, 19 years uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. I was the head coach of women's gymnastics. What a great experience that was for me. Typically, I would take the month of August, travel the country, meet with my top prospects and give them and their families every indication I had sincere interest in their daughter as a prospective mm -hmm. student athlete. And yep. the one thing I realized when I was out there that I was at a pretty clear advantage in recruiting where families really didn't have a good knowledge base as far yep. as uh, recruiting uh, NCAA procedures were concerned, nor in several cases where they uh, did they have viable plans uh, put together for an important life decision their children were going to make. So about 15 years ago, I retired from coaching and started Victory Collegiate Consulting as a means of providing that guidance for boys and girls. And it's a privilege for me uh, and the families that I work with from around the country worldwide in helping them navigate the college search. Um, Bob, before we begin, is is there a way that I can share my um my PowerPoint with the audience. Yeah, so so you should be able to, and, and Justin, I, I don't know if you're behind the scenes here to be able to, at the bottom, there might be a green share your screen uh, tab there. You can click that and it should pull up whatever you see on your screen. Okay, uh, so we will, let's, let's see if this is it. And, oh, okay, let's see here. Perfect. Yeah. So, yep. So Tom, you could, you could probably expand it out a little bit. I think we're, we're trying to see if it if we can, yeah, at the top there, maybe expand it. Yep. There we go. Is, is that good? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or yeah. If you, if you put in the, maybe the present mode there, we should be able to see it, but we, we can see it as is also. So, so you're good from there, Tom, if you want to leave it like All right, that. why don't we get started then? Yep. And uh, um, well, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure uh, being able to have the opportunity to speak with everyone tonight. And thanks for taking the time out uh, for what's going to be a, a terrific quest for our boys and girls. Yep. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the college recruiting process, specifically about prospective student athletes 
and how they can maximize this effort. Today's athletic culture is much different than it was 25 years ago. Uh, college coaches are seen as CEOs of small organizations that are expected to do well and do well on a regular basis. Um, athletic, college athletic directors expect their coaches to achieve two things, one win and two raise money and lots of it. Yeah. Um, therefore, uh, recruitment becomes the tool of choice that college coaches use in order to drive their program to higher levels year in and year out. The NCAA Eligibility Center is an organization that collaborates with the NCAA. They're not part of the NCAA, but registration uh, for any prospective student athlete that's interested in being part of a Division I or a Division II program is mandatory. Um, you want to be able to take care of this uh, before your son or daughter steps foot on a college campus uh, in the fall. The one thing you don't want him or her to do is to show up and not be eligible by the NCAA. So it's a two-step process. Step one, you can take care of online. If you Google NCAA eligibility, it'll drive you right to the website. And it takes about 25 minutes to take care of the first part of registration. Any information that your son or daughter cannot uh, fill in at that point in time can be filled in at a later time. Okay. The second part of registration is working with the high school college advisor or guidance counselor. Yep. And um, basically what they're going to do is they're going to forward everything academic on to the NCAA eligibility center, school transcripts, uh, standardized test scores, school profile if necessary. Okay. Um, and the, regist the re registration really is the demanding part. Um, our boys and girls are going to be eligible, I can almost guarantee you, okay? But you want to be able to be ahead of the curve and make sure that you're taking care of registration. And I would say after the sophomore year, begin registering, do, doing that first part of registering with okay. the NCAA Eligibility Center. Campus visits is a real important link in the recruiting chain, okay? And whether it's the unofficial visit or the official visit, visit is the operative. It's important to know the difference between the two. The official visit is one that's basically paid in part or in full by a college or university. Prospects can take a total number of five official visits with no more than one to any particular institution. It's permission-based, so they're gonna to have to have done the first part of registration with the NCAA eligibility center. And there's time restraints. They're allowed to remain on campus for 48 hours, okay? The unofficial visit, on the other hand, is one that's paid in part, uh, or I should say one that is basically paid by the family, can be taken virtually at any time, and prospects are permitted to take um, an unlimited number of unofficial visits and multiple visits to the same institution. The only difference here is that with the unofficial visit, prospects are not permitted to engage college coaches on campus until September 1st at the start of the junior year in high school. Mm -hmm. So you can make those unofficial visits, register for the information session, the tour, poke around campus, even go over the, to the athletic facility. But you can't engage the coach in recruiting conversation, not until September 1st, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. But the important thing is get out there and visit, okay? Yep. You want to get a look under the hood. You want to get an opportunity to see what these institutions have to offer. Contacts and evaluations are all part of really the recruiting planning that prospective student athletes are going to go through, okay? Contacts, we're talking about um, phone contact, email contact, uh, texting, face-to-face uh, -face contact, uh, Zoom meetings with college coaches, okay? And this is an area of the recruiting process that our boys and girls really need to wrap their arms around and feel empowered, okay, in being proactive in communicating with the college coaches. 
as you can imagine, the volume of recruits that college coaches are looking at is growing by the year. Okay. Sure. And what we want to do, what, what, our, what we want to do is we want to help our boys and girls find a way to get ahead of the pack in, in recruiting. And mm -hmm. the more um, our, our, our boys and girls are in charge of contacting the college coaches, yes. and providing them with information that will help them evaluate them as a student, as an athlete, and yep. as a young man or woman of yep. high character will help them navigate this process with efficiency and speed. Evaluations on the other hand, basically are in the realm of college coaches, okay? Leave it to them to basically get an idea to what type of athlete uh, you are, what type of student you are. You provide them with the information they need and they're going to have the opportunity to review that highlight video. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, to review your transcripts, standardized test scores, especially mm -hmm. with the more select academic institutions, and get an idea of whether or not um, you would they would be able to support your application in admissions. Uh, communication is really the cornerstone of, of college recruiting. I touched on that in the last chapter. We're looking for ways for our boys and girls to separate themselves from the pack. Always remember that college coaches are recruiting on three levels. They're looking for strong students, impact athletes, and those boys and girls that bring a strong character component to the table. And I think it's really important for um, our moms and dads, club coaches, high school coaches to empower our children. Okay. And they might feel a little bit uncomfortable in the beginning, but it's like anything else. The more they do something, the better they're going to get. And they're always looking for ways in order to let the college coaches know that they're in charge of their destiny. So taking a, a strong leadership role in that communication tool is going to make it the difference between a good recruiting process and a great recruiting process. Oops. Okay, um, athletic scholarships. Okay, the first thing I think it's important to realize is that there's not an abundance of athletic scholarships out there. 75% of the student athletes, the over 400,000 student athletes in college are not on athletic scholarships, okay? Um, so they're not abundant, okay? Um, I think it's important that Families understand uh, the difference between sports that are considered headcount sports and those that are considered equivalency. Okay, so heads headcount sports are sports that uh, provide athletic, full athletic scholarships for the number of allotted scholarships for that particular team. Okay, so for instance, men's basketball their upper limit is 13. That means that 13 guys or 13 gals on that team are gonna be on full scholarship. That's a headcount sport. Whereas equivalency sports like lacrosse, um, baseball, soccer, track and field, okay? They too have an upper limit. We'll use lacrosse as an example, 12 athletic scholarships. But these coaches can take their scholarships and split them into partials. So a track and field program might have 35 guys on the team. Okay. And they can, or let's use uh, lacrosse as, a, as an example. They have 12, 12 guys on the team. Okay. Uh, or I should say 12 scholarships available, 36 guys on the team. They mm -hmm. can spread those scholarships out into yep. partial scholarships to cover maybe not everyone, but a good portion of the members of the team, yep. okay? Helping the college coaches evaluate your, your talent as an athlete is crucial, okay? When it comes to athletic scholarships, coaches are evaluating primarily in the area of athletics, period. 
They want to determine just where you potentially can meet their program needs in filling gaps and driving that program to a higher level. So the more you provide the coaches with the information to help them evaluate you best, highlight video, schedule, showcases, tournaments that you'll be attending, um, attending camps, college camps, in order to get a direct evaluation right on campus is only going to make this recruiting process easier and give you a better chance of attaining an athletic scholarship. Okay. So as far as signing the national letter of intent is concerned, um, there is a, uh, an initial signing period that's in early November and the regular signing period ends in August after the senior year. So during the senior year is the signing of the National Letter of Intent. Yep. And financial aid for what we're talking about is programs that have either exhausted their scholarships or don't offer athletic scholarships like Division Three programs. Uh, Division One AA programs like the Ivy League do not offer athletic scholarships. And communicating with the coaches and trying to determine if they have an inside track to help you look for additional scholarships. Scholarship is scholarship, no matter how you look at it. Grant is grant. It's money we don't have to pay back. So athletic scholarships just happens to be one form of grant. There's hundreds of millions of dollars of grant that are out there. Academic, leadership, community, and communicating with coach and getting an idea to what type of relationship she, ha she or he has on the inside of that program regarding financial aid can be incredibly helpful. When I was coaching at Penn, I was coaching at a school that yep. did not give athletic scholarships, okay? But I made sure that I had a leg up in financial aid where I could at least direct families and help them potentially qualify for grant other than athletic grant. Sure. And we're moving down the home stretch here. Um, there could very well be a situation where you've got um, Bob student athletes that are looking at um, uh, select academic institutions like the division yep. three NESCAC schools, yep. uh, like the Ivy league Patriot league um, opportunities where the, the driver here is really the academic piece. Sure. And where they might not gain an athletic scholarship, they could very well use their athletic ability as a leg up in the admissions process. I went through this for 19 years at Penn, where I can say accurately that 85% of my student athletes would never have been admitted to Penn if it wasn't for my support in the admissions process. Mm -hmm. So um, that is powerful. And yeah. uh, so for students that have the ability to be accepted to uh, these select academic institutions is yeah. worth looking into. And the difference really is it's not so much about the four year experience as much as what that four year experience is going to provide over the next 40 years. Sure. Sure. The um, students are going to be uh, providing the coaches with information that will help them evaluate. Profile and, and, and highlight video are two important areas there. The player profile should be a balanced profile, one page PDF that um, equally provides academic and athletic information for the college coaches to evaluate. Leave some room at the bottom of the, of the player profile for a personal mission statement and for a coach testimonial, which can okay. be very powerful. It's good. And um, the header at the top of the profile should simply in include year of graduation, make sure the coach knows um, uh, what sport you're, you're playing, contact information, and uh, an action photo. Your um, highlight video is going to differ 
depending on the sport, the time of year. Okay. Sure. Um, but what you want to do is always remember, provide the coach with the information he or she needs in order to evaluate you as an athlete. Okay. Remember, you're looking to fill potential gaps in a, in a program. Okay. You want to be forthright, be honest, be truthful uh, as far as your video is, is concerned. And the rule of thumb is simple. Whatever the college coach asks for, provide. Okay. So that highlight video is going to be really um, um, provided on two levels. One practice video and the other competition video. And finally, uh, Bob, the, the, the manner in which our families manage and organize the recruiting process is um, gonna be crucial in, in success. And putting together a good organization system, targeting um, assignments and communicating with the college coaches, providing them with regular updates, moving ahead, from season to season to season, there's always something to communicate with the college coaches that will help them evaluate your sons and daughter on those three levels that we talked about, student, athlete, young man, young woman of integrity, okay? And um, from that point, uh, moving forward, a great time really to begin the college recruiting process is somewhere between the freshman and sophomore year where you're gathering this information, growing an awareness to how the procedures work, putting together a plan of action, maybe putting together your player profile and yep. um, the first draft of your college list, but be, becoming informed and educated to what your role is in this process and executing that plan from start to finish. Yeah. yeah. So and that's so, college so recruiting. Yeah. So, Tom, so Tom, you brought up, you brought up a couple a couple of different points here. I know we've talked about this over the years. Um, one point you you stretched uh, you you touched on a little bit earlier. You know, uh, it's tough as a counselor. I, I you know I talk about recruiting to to families and parents. And and one thing that you know is always is a little bit scary sometimes that pops up. It's it's the parent that's um, you know, they want they want so much what's best for their child and. You know, I'm just on the counseling side of it, helping with the admissions part and just kind of getting a peek onto things and kind of just trying to steer them in the right direction. But sometimes I just get concerned. And you mentioned it earlier, really empowering the, empowering the student athlete, empowering them uh, it is so crucial because there's certain times, Tom, that I see that the parents doing absolutely everything and that that becomes complicated in the situation. And I feel, you know, Tom, doing this for years, I feel like talking to a lot of these recruiters and, and different people calling me from different sports you know, it, it's concerning to them where, where the parents doing absolutely everything. It, it starts to concern the coach of what, what do I have in my hands? Is this kid going to be able to do anything on their own by the time they get to me, you know? So that, that's one part of powering that student athlete was important, what you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, the college coaches, Bob, want to hear from the parents. They, you know, it's a, uh, it's a package deal, yeah. but um, you know, when you really break it down, it's the boys and girls that are going to be attending that school. They're the ones that are going to be impacting that program. They're the ones that are going to grow the um, everything good and positive on the inside of the team. So they want to hear from the prospects. And even if the kids are stumbling and make mistakes early in the communication process, the coaches aren't looking at the mistakes. They're looking for the recovery, if that makes yep. sense. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, so, so a couple of questions come in uh, to the chat here. If you don't mind me uh, fielding a couple of these. Uh, sure. Uh, um, sure. So, so Tom, uh, you know, one, one question is asking about uh, when, when can they possibly reach out to a college coach? I know you kind of covered that a little bit, but I guess al along with that, um, you know, it's too early. And I know this is hard for the sport, a little bit difficult, but it, 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 can, can you communicate too early where, you know, if you're in your ninth grade year, you're in your sophomore year and you're, you're you know, you're kind of playing the, the junior varsity level and not the varsity. You know, it, can, can you can you contact these college coaches too early, number one? And then um, along with that, you know, Tom, kind of a dual dual question here. I can get out of you here while I have some time with you. Is there ever too much communication from a parent or from a student to a coach? Uh, you know, if you don't mind me kind of combining both those questions into one. Yeah, so if you look at the NCAA manual, the definition of a prospective student athlete is one who has started classes for the ninth grade, okay? Is that when you're actually, your children are actually engaging college coaches robustly? No, not necessarily, okay? 
Um, now, college coaches are restricted to when they can actually begin communicating directly with prospective student athletes. And it depends on, on the sport, but it's either June 15th after the sophomore year in high school or September 1st after the sophomore year in high school. It depends on the sport. Okay. okay. But that doesn't mean that the prospects, boys and girls, can communicate earlier with the college coaches to, in a sense, lay the foundation, but do it in a subtle way where they're actually providing them with a player profile, sure. general highlight video, yep. summer tournament schedule, maybe um, questions about a summer camp that the coaches are are sponsoring on campus and coaches can respond to that. Yep. Okay. But I think, um, you know, is it, is there a time that's too early? I would, I would say that making a robust effort in the freshman year uh, is not necessary, sure. but planting the seeds in the sophomore year yep. uh, when you're hitting the ground running just yep. before the start of the junior year is ideal. Okay. All right, good, good. Tom, two more questions, and then we'll actually kick things over to, to my buddy Griffin uh, Jackson from Westchester University to talk about the PASHI system. Uh, Tom, we, we had a question come in to the chat about uh, submitting videos to, to, uh, of highlight reels, different things to schools, and, and how to go about that. Again, I, I know this is tough, Tom. I'm, I'm trying, I don't want to paint a picture here that you're answering for every sport, every sport in America here that students get recruited for. But my point is, is that it could look very different depending upon the sport. And you mentioned that earlier. But I guess some of the questions that I get from parents, you know, are you better off maybe just uh, sending your highlight videos, creating that, creating that video and sending it directly to the coach themselves? Or, or should you be doing a combination of doing that along with maybe utilizing some of these uh, websites that are, are a central database for students um, that, that, that you could put, post your videos on there, start a profile with them? You know, are you better off doing it independently, using the, these websites? And, and at times, Tom, I also get questions from parents you know, they say, hey, Mr. Fendor, listen, um, some of these websites are trying to charge me for this to, to have my video up and charge me that. I mean, how do you kind of navigate those waters? Yeah, and I think there are some tremendous resources out there and, and, and organizations that host um, prospective student athletes and their, their highlight videos. I think they're fantastic. Um, me, Bob, you know, I'm kind of an old fashioned guy, and I think it's really important for our kids to take an old fashioned approach. And I think if they try to personalize yep. this recruiting process yep. and communicate directly with the college coaches and really try to establish that personal relationship with them, that's an example of something that's going to help them stand out compared to everyone else that's out there. Okay. Yep. Um, now, you know, I mean, every sport is different. Every kid is different. Um and, you know, certain families have certain resources as far as uh, uh, highlight video taping, the time, the organization, and it's just tougher these days, you know. Yeah. So it could be very, you know, uh, you know, uh, highlight video using some of these online resources can be very helpful. Um, and, um, you know, but, but again, it's like, like I said before, I think that uh, it, if the families can in any way um, put a little bit more effort into um, keeping that target uh, in-house and communicating directly with the college coaches, I think they'll see this recruiting process grow a little bit faster um, yes. and be more effective. That's my gut feel. No, it's nice. Thanks, Tom. All right, last question for you here, Tom. Um, I'll, I'll kick things over to, to Griffin. Um, so, Tom, the, the, uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit with the eligibility uh, earlier, but I just want to make sure it's clear because this is an important one. Does the NCAA require SAT and ACT scores for eligibility? Right now, they do. Yeah. Okay. Is yeah. that going to change anytime soon? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we're kind of taking it, you know, we're kind of taking it week by week, month by yes. month. Yes. Um, same thing with, you know, colleges and universities that went test optional last, yes. last year. Absolutely. Okay. But whether or not the decision to not go or change um, the criteria 
for yep. NCAA eligibility. Um, yep. You know, I think that it's 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 good for the for our boys and girls to stay ahead of the curve and and remain on target as far as uh, standardized testing is concerned. Yep, that's great. So we'll talk, thanks, Tom. Hey, hey, Tom. Uh, again, I, I appreciate you and you're out. Just the the feedback, the the, the you know the, the detail, attention to detail here. I know. I know, you know, kind of as I was joking with uh, Commander Dave Augustine earlier, I, I know it's hard when I, I start firing some of these questions at you. They're very broad, and, and, and uh, you know, it's hard for you to kind of talk about representing all the different sports and what it looks like. But I really love how you break things down and kind of make it so organized. So I, I do appreciate that. So, so Tom, th thanks again for your time, and uh, just thanks for being a great resource for our community. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. Talk to you soon. Right, great. No problem. No problem. All right. We'll see you later. You bet. Um, so, Bye. Griffin, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have Tom here. He'll he can uh, uh, stop uh, Tom at the bottom. I think you uh, unshare your screen there, and I'll, I'll kick things over to uh, to, to Griffin. So, I, everyone, this is uh, Griffin Jackson. He's one of the missions representatives from Westchester. Thanks, Tom. One of the missions uh, representatives from uh, Westchester University. Um, Griffin, again, kind of the same theme here as I just mentioned to Tom and Commander Dave Augustine. I don't need you to speak on behalf of the entire. Pennsylvania state school system as far as the Pashi schools, but, but um, you know, if you can kind of, kind of cover some of the basics here tonight on what it looks like to apply to a Pashi school and, um, you know, what, what, and then obviously, you know, get a little more detailed about Westchester University, some things that Westchester has to offer. We have plenty of students that apply to Westchester University. Uh, Griffin, you know, we're, we're right down the road. I know you mentioned earlier, you grew up not too far from Westchester, you know, being at Unionville, we're, we're you know, 10, 15 minutes away. So, so we're very fortunate from that standpoint. Uh, but Griffin, if you don't mind, just to start things off, if you need just a little background about yourself uh, before you start to jump into to, to discussing topics that we, we mentioned earlier. Sure, absolutely, Bob. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, for having me, for sure. Uh, this is awesome. Happy to talk about the Apache schools and especially Westchester. Um, like Bob was saying, uh, I grew up in the Westchester area, so it is near and dear to my heart. Um, but I actually didn't go to Westchester or any of our Apache schools. I went to a school up in Rhode Island, uh, for culinary arts and food service management. So I wasn't part of the school system for a while. Um, I was up and down the East Coast after I went to university for about five or six years, uh, working in different restaurants and uh, hotels. But my heart's been in Pennsylvania, my family's been in Pennsylvania, and Westchester is something that's out of this world. It's a beautiful town for anybody who's been there. So I said, you know what, I'm back. And uh, Westchester University had a position open that Perfect. fit my skill set. Yeah. So um, I applied for it and started up in September, and it has been absolutely fantastic. I loved Perfect. it being able to travel around to different schools, talking to students, kind of telling them about their admissions um, mm -hmm. and application processes that they're going through. It is a very tough time for students as they go through the application process and especially for parents as well. Stress is crazy. So yeah. being able to ease that for a lot of people has been fantastic. It's been an awesome experience. Um, and as you were saying, Westchester is part of the PASHI system. So um, very simplistic. It is our Pennsylvania state system of higher education, yep. which includes about 14 different universities. Um, many of these names I... I'm assuming most of you will know. So Bloomsburg, California, Cheney, Clarion, yep. Millersville, Shippensburg, lots of schools, um, part of the Pennsylvania state system. Yep. Um, and the basic goal of the PASHI system is to make these four-year university educations attainable for a lot of people. So that, that was really the main goal in the unification of bringing these uni universities together. Yep. Um, so the biggest thing that is offered from Apache system school is a lower tuition for our Pennsylvania residents. So that's, that's a huge thing for um, our students to know is that as a Pennsylvania resident, your tuition is going to be maybe even a third at points of what our out-of-state students are looking at, what these private schools are looking at. Yep. So they're fantastic universities to go to and they're very affordable for our Pennsylvania residents. So it's something that I love to point out to a lot of people. Um, something that is not known that is an awesome benefit of our Apache system is um, you can, if you go to one of our Apache schools, so say you are going to Westchester for business. Yep. And uh, you hear Millersville has this fantastic professor who is teaching this really cool class going on. And 
you want to go, you can. You can apply to be a visiting student to go and take that credit, that class over at um, Millersville, Shippensburg at the other Apache school, and that can transfer back over. It won't wow. hinder your Westchester graduation in any way, That's shape, great. or form. You can transfer that credit right over. That's great. And speaking of credit transfer, that's another huge thing. Uh, as the Apache school system, we have a huge um, agreement with our community colleges in Pennsylvania. Absolutely. So we make it super easy and um, your credits are very transferable from your community colleges going into university. Yeah, so, so Griffin, yeah, I'm to interrupt, but you, you know, you bring up such a great point and, and, uh, and you know, um, not, not just from the community college standpoint of, you know, we have Delaware Community College right down the road here, media, the, uh, the downtown branch down there. Um, you know, we have a number of students that, that, that kind of pump right into our pipeline from there into, into our state school system. But, um, you know, Griff, you brought up a really good point about taking courses. And, uh, and it just reminded me, I had a student a few years ago take advantage of that um, and, uh, you know, going to um, uh, Westchester University. But, um, you know, within between Westchester, Millersville, Cheney, um, you know, even Shippensburg and Bloomsburg, uh, let alone East Stroudsburg. I mean, with these institutions aren't that 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 far away that a lot of our students tend to filter in coming from Unionville High School. And, and just, you just bring up a really good point about these different programs and being able to take advantage of, of taking coursework at, at the other institutions. And I'm happy you brought that up. Yeah. And so it, it's even transferring, like, say, hmm, Bloomsburg, it's a little far from me. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about it. My parents went to Bloomsburg. They love Bloomsburg. But, you know, it's my family. I want to go back to Westchester, which is yep. what I did after my nine years of traveling. You can transfer right over. Those, those yep. credits are That's all great. transferable. And it's, it's a huge benefit of being part of the Apache system. One is that lower tuition and the ease of transfer, the ease of access for our Pennsylvania yep. residents is absolutely wonderful. There have been a few um, changes recently in the PASHI system. It's kind of um, confusing a lot of people because they're like, oh my God, what's going on? Because we're having some integration with some schools okay. um, going on. So in the North, um, sorry, in some of our Western schools, so California, Clarion, and Edinburgh okay. are integrating together. So okay. it's kind of a combination of leadership and resources yep. and um, especially those student resources. So. Yep it's actually making it um, easier and more unified and more student focused for them to have that ease of transfer going on. It helps with longevity for these universities as well. They'll keep their names. There'll be, um, so you'll be going to California, you'll be going to Clarion, you'll be going to Edinburgh, but you'll have this unified system that is there to assist you. Sure. Um, and so the same thing is going to be happening in the Northeast as well. So with Bloomsburg, Lock Haven, and Mansfield, they're going to be doing that same kind of integration process. Okay. Yep. So once again, they're keeping these university names that we know we love and we've heard of our entire lives here in Pennsylvania. Yep. They're just unifying themselves and making it a lot easier for our students to have that transfer and kind of um, ease of communication as well um, sure. up the ladder to keep our PASHI system unified and um, knowing what's going on. It also increases opportunities for our students. So with that transfer, it is a lot easier to be taking classes at these um, schools that are integrated together. Yep. Um, you get all of your credits transferred there, which is awesome. That's great. And it capitalizes on the existing strengths of these schools. So there's transfer of faculty as well going on between the schools. So this, this professor might have a class over in Bloomsburg Yep. on Mondays and Wednesdays, but Tuesdays and Thursdays, he's over in Lock Haven. Gotcha. So whereas before he was only teaching in Bloomsburg, now yep. we get Professor Smith, who is phenomenal in his field, moving between these schools. So there's great. an increase of um, touches for these students and being able to utilize these resources a lot better. That's cool. That's cool. Um, and so since, Bob, you were saying I'm, I'm Part of the application or part of the admissions team over at Westchester. So the application process is kind of um, one of the things that I love to touch on. For yeah. most of these schools, um, the Common App is actually where you're going to be applying. And Great. once again, ease of use for our students, and that's kind of kind of the key with the Apache system, along with um, making it more attainable to get these educations. It is easy, easy, easy to apply. Yep. For Common App, you can go right on in. Some schools have an application fee, some don't. It is not um, specified depending on which one you're applying to. 
Okay. But you go in and all these schools have the same questions. You fill out one application. You can send your essays if they're required. They're not always required. At Westchester, we don't require an essay. You can have one if you want to. Okay. Um, so you can put your essays in there. You can put your recommendations in there. You can um, then just have your um, counselor send your transcripts to whichever school. You yep. click in in the app which school you want to send your application to send whatever necessary fees are there and boom easy you've just applied to seven schools yeah that's great easy people yep um and i also know that a lot of our apache system schools uh went test optional during the pandemic and are staying test optional for the next year or two at least um once again keeping with ease of use for our students yep but being test optional for a school is it's interesting because we will we will happily see your SAT or ACT scores. Mm -hmm. If you don't like them, you do not have to send them in. Yep. That's that's what test optional means. You don't have to send them in if you don't want to. But and say you like your second scores over your first score. Say you take them again later in the year after you've already applied. If you haven't heard from your school yet, you can always send that score later. So yeah. say initially you're like, oh man, I didn't. I did really bad. I didn't like my score. But then you take it a second time and you're like, holy smokes, I just got a 1250. <laughs> Send it in. Please yep. let us see. We love to Great. take a look at it. I always do want to give a word of warning. If you decide to send them in, we can't unsee them. Yeah. Is the only That's a thing. great point, Griff. I'm happy you brought that up. So I'm, I'm happy if you want to send them in. But if they are sent in, we cannot unsee them. So yep. one, once they are part of your application and it's being processed and it's in the reading portion, we can't unsee that. So I always, I always stress a little bit of caution because you have the option. Sure. You have the option to hold back on your test scores. So if you're like, mm, I don't know, like, I don't know if it's going to hinder me or what, hold it back. You don't have to say it. You can do a little research. We do have uh, on most of our, Apache school websites, we have our kind of averages for our SATs and ATC, ACT scores that we've had in past years. Mm -hmm. So at Westchester for last year, it was 1140 for our students, which once again, we would test optional. So we're not looking at every single accepted student's sure. test score there, but it is something to look at. So you have the option to go in and take a look, do a little research and like, hmm, is this what I want to send? Do I want mm -hmm. them to see this? And yep. if it is, absolutely. Click that little box that says yes. We are more than happy to look at it. That's great. Um, there are several schools in the Apache system that are rolling admissions, which is a little bit different than what you would think. So I always say apply early, as early as you can, if you know what you want to do. Um, at Westchester specifically, um, we have one major that is extraordinarily competitive. It's about a class size of 70 students or so. So that's our nursing major. It is very difficult to get in. Um, we are looking at students and it was, it was pretty much closed by early December. We were, we were pretty much done looking at our nursing students by early December because we get fantastic students applying, applying early, they know what they want to do, getting in there. So if you're looking for something like that, if you're looking for those more competitive majors, those um, smaller, more specialized, more difficult to get into majors, apply early. Get your recommendations in early. Get your essays. Know, have your transcripts. Talk to your counselors at school and get everything in as early as you can, for, especially for those specific majors. For other majors that are a little bit more open, it can take a little bit more time. You can relax a little bit. Um, for a lot of students, I do recommend having your initial um, applications in to say your first one, two, three schools that you're thinking about, usually around Thanksgiving to early December time. If mm -hmm. you're if you're not 100% sure what you want to do or where you want to go, you have a little bit more time with it. I say you can, you can wait a little bit and have it in by about Thanksgiving, December time. 
And then for rolling admissions, we're looking at applications every day. We're reading them, reading them, reading them. And a lot of our schools are getting thousands and thousands of applications. So it does take a little bit of time. Yeah. Uh, so, so Griffin, if you don't mind me asking, they, sure. um, you mentioned earlier about the, um, about the Common App. Um, and, and uh, you know, I know families are kind of navigating that uh, system, but if they, if, they don't use that, if they don't use Common App, right? I mean, they're, they're still essentially apply directly to the, to the university through their online websites, typically for the Pashi schools? Yes. So for the Pashi schools, um, so Westchester itself, for our um, first year students, for those first year applications, we do require you to use the Common App, but you can go directly to our website and you can do this with every um, one of the PASHI schools. You can go directly to our websites um, and there'll be a big button somewhere that says apply now, my application sure. and sure. things like that. And yep. it will lead you whether it's to the Common App or it'll lead you to um, the university specific gotcha. application. Okay. Um, for Westchester, our first year students are just common app only Okay. for our That's transfer students. Uh, we do have our additional Westchester application that they can go through instead. Okay. Okay. And Griff, you, you mentioned a little bit about, um, you start talking about letters of recommendation. And again, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't expect you to speak on behalf of all, all of the Apache schools here, but just uh, I'm behind what you see behind Westchester university. Um, you know, uh, some some of the schools are, hey, look, just don't send them. We're not we're not we're not accepting letters of recommendation. Some schools are, hey, we we rec uh, recommend you send them. Some are optional, and then, and then obviously some schools, you know, kind of go down the road of, hey, this is this is a requirement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for what we're looking for. Can you speak to that a little bit about letters of recommendation? Because we get a lot of questions about that each year as counselors. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as you were saying, letters of recommendation are kind of a hot button hot button topic. They can go many different ways. Um, and I guess the catch all is, what are you applying to? What are you applying for? What are you looking for? So if you're looking to be an accounting major, getting into mathematics, things like that, have an application from your math teacher. So your junior year, you took statistics and got an A plus and your teacher and you really hit it off. And you're like, you know what? I like math. I want to get into stats. I want to get into mathematics, things like that. If that's what you're applying for, get a recommendation from them. We absolutely will take a look. If it is there, same thing with the SAT scores. If it is there, I can't unsee it. Yep. So send those recommendations from the teachers, the counselors, the yep. coaches who you've had the best connection with, who can speak best to you and your strengths. Yep. So if they are optional, if recommendations are optional, send them in. Yep, I got you. If, yeah. if, you, okay. if you have the right person, send it in. You don't need yep. more than one. You can have one. You can have four. But if you have that, these people who know you and know your strengths and what you're looking to do and can speak yep. to you as a person, send them in. Yeah. So, so Griffin, you mentioned about rolling admissions. Westchester University is still rolling admissions at this point. We are. Yep. Yeah. So, Griffin, if you don't mind, and, and I go, it's a very tricky uh, question to answer here, but I'm just give me a ballpark idea if you can for our families. When you talk about rolling admissions, and, and Griffin, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but but um, when when do you as admissions people even get to start to really take a look at, at some of the applications and w w just again a ballpark idea because. You know, we talk about get them in early, get them in early. And I have family saying to me, Mr. Doe, I want to get my applications in on August 1st. And, and again, I try to explain a lot of admissions, admissions officers and admission teams are not even necessarily working at the end of August or they're preparing for the previous class that's coming in already um, and helping out with that uh, portion of things. So when do, when, when do you get a chance to take a look at some of the applications and, and, and kind of start to take a peek into different things? Yeah, um, so we kind of have some some jumps kind of as we're as we're going so okay um we'll get those early applications in at the beginning um so we started looking at applications usually around like the middle of october or so is when we started looking at and we had a decent amount of applications already in um so these are going to be the applications that we're looking at for the top tier students who got them in early they're sure. my nursing students my biomedical engineering my yeah. 4.0 students like that's kind of what we're looking at in that earlier sense there and yeah. then like i was getting into like that thanksgiving early december time yep. Yep. is when we're getting a lot more applications so we kind of pick it up a bit more because october is part of that travel 
uh, travel time. So a lot of yep. the um, individuals who are reading our applications are also traveling to these different schools. So we're sure. um, moving around and talking to specific students at different schools um, around Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and everywhere. So no, yeah, hey Griffin, th thanks for clearing it up because, like I said, sometimes you, you end up getting families that are just so anxious about the process that they're trying to get things in the summer and we're trying to tell it doesn't necessarily work that way. And, you know, they get, get a little bit antsy when, when there's not necessarily that set date, it's not an early action date of November 1st, you know, and they, they want to work through things. So I'm, I'm happy you were able to clear that up for, for us and, and get an idea of that. Um, you know, Griff, another question that we get a lot in our counseling center, you, you started to touch on it right away. And, and, you know, um, you know, for years we worked with uh, Lauren Lang over there in admissions um, over at Westchester you know, we, we talked a lot with the Westchester University admissions in particular about we have a number of students that end up applying to the nursing program uh, over there. And like you said, it is extremely competitive um, in that, you know, there's times where you can need a couple extra hundred points on an SAT to potentially oh, get absolutely. in or even or a significant different different uh, GPA. And I know over the years that Westchester's adjusted that. So when you talk about those averages of the previous class that was admitted, um, I know that you kind of promote a little bit of, hey, this is a little different for our, our nursing program. Um you know, just off the top of your head, are there any more programs that you would say over at Westchester University that are, are a little bit more competitive to get in just from the sheer number of applicants um, that they get that you get you get each, each year that that's getting a little more competitive that you start to see? Sure. Um, so nursing is number one, bar none, the <laughs> most competitive sure. um, that we have. Um, but as for competitive, not as much for our other majors, but there are other majors that have differing requirements for um, our students. So um, say for one, our music and art programs that we've got going on. Yep. Music students have to audition okay. and our art students have to send in a portfolio. Okay. So they have to be accepted into this the university first. Like they have to meet, um, at least the bare minimum of, of our university requirements and be able to be admitted, say, into Undecided. And then we send them over to our music department for an audition. Um, so our music and art um, departments, they will have a whole separate kind of admissions portion there for sure. those students. So that is sure. an additional um, necessity for these students to go through. And it is um, definitely more difficult to get in there. Um, and then some of our other kind of medical profession based majors are going to have higher uh, requirements, say to um, our business or language majors. Okay. okay. So like our biomedical engineering, nutrition a little bit, health sciences, things like that. So they're going to have like a higher GPA um, requirement for that, usually a 3.0 to 3.3 um, around there, minimum for most of these um, kind of medically based okay. um, majors there for you. Okay, all right. And uh, so, so Griffin, we actually had uh, one or two more, more questions pop in here um, for, for uh, related to Pashi and to, to the school system. Um, just in general, and I know, again, we're not trying to have you speak on behalf of everyone, but, but if, you can, if you can, just in general, what are some of the common mistakes you see some of the students make as far as the applications go, or maybe they're missing certain information, or just anything you've seen here over the last year or so, um, uh, you know, that, that you tend to say, hey, this is something that I would recommend your students, you know, look out for, try not to make these mistakes that I've seen some of the students mistake, uh, make mistakes in the past. Sure. Um, so one thing that uh, I personally noticed is, and honestly, it's, it's because of what's happened in the world over the last two years. Um, sure. I've seen a lot of commonality in essays that I'm reading. So a lot of essays that I've read, and I would probably say about 50% or more of the essays that were provided to me in applications were in some way, shape, or form related to the pandemic that went on. Gotcha. And it was a huge event, um, but as somebody who's reading hundreds, if not thousands of applications, it's the same thing. It's very repetitive. So Thank if you. I, if I could suggest with, if, with your essays, be different. Yeah. Like <laughs> I always make a joke out of this because of an English teacher I had many, many years ago, yeah. write about the perfect chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. 
<laughs> like do something to stand out. Like yeah. tell me about that perfect day yep. out on a tennis court or Sorry. like the best meal you've ever had. Just something, something to kind of open you up. Something, something that you're passionate about. Yep. So, so showcasing yourself. Whereas, when, and I, I repeat, the pandemic was a huge thing and it's impacted Absolutely. us in un, untold ways. But yep. everybody's had these experiences. Yeah. No, Gr Griffin, you're, you're you're saying you're saying it well. It's it, we've believe in us is, is our third webinar now, and I feel like almost every admissions rep in in one one point or another during these webinars they, they bring that up. I mean, I think even I don't know if it's on the Common App off the top of my head, but I know in a lot of the applications there's a specific question to students on there about you know has this pandemic affected you in a particular way? And when you're and when you're and, and, and parents and students ask me all the time, Mr. Fedora, should I answer that question? And to your point, I mean, has this has this significantly impacted you? different than everybody else to a certain degree, you know, I mean, and, and some people it has, and, and that's why that question's there. I mean, some people, their entire family have lost all their jobs and, and, and something from that standpoint, you know, but um, for everybody to have a little bit more of a difficult setback with their education to a certain degree, yeah, there's, there's been a little bit of setbacks for everyone across the board uh, well, from that standpoint. So you bring up a really good point and, and, and it's nice to hear, nice for our community to be able to hear it from somebody who reads all of these essays and, and, and to your point, to be able to see that same kind kind of concept coming in time and time again. I'm happy you brought that up for us. So in, in continuation with that, there is a specific question on the Common App that says, yeah. how has this affected sure. you? That isn't your essay. Sure. So <laughs> yep. there, there have been a number of applications where it's been, essay has been about this, and then it's reiterated here. Yep. And the, the question itself, I love that they put it in there, like, how has it affected you? And we take that into account very seriously. Like I had, I lost this, this, and this, and yep, yep. all of these things. And, and we see that and it, it does show trends in transcripts. And it's, it's something we definitely take into account um, as an admissions team. We see this, we notice it, and we understand where some of gotcha. these grade dips okay. are coming from and things like that. No, that's but great. when it comes to the essay, this is a personal essay. This is, yeah. I want to hear about you. Sure. So, yeah. and what, what no, makes who you, you, so. Yeah, no, Griff, that, thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, hey listen, Griff, last, last question for you here. And we're, we're going to start to wrap things up here. Um, it, it, it's related around the, and again, I'm getting emails and in contact with a lot of the Pashi schools here um, it, it, related around college visits. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, first and foremost, are, are, is Westchester University opening up to in-person visits? Um, does that look a little bit different now? I mean, if you could talk anything about, speak to that at all, and kind of the plans moving forward for visits and, and, and college visits on, on Westchester's campus. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So we are, we are definitely open to in-person visits. Um, we have them at Westchester. We have them every day, um, except for, yeah, no, we have them pretty much every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, okay. We have big events coming up actually this Saturday we have one of our accepted student days and we have another one happening in April um, so we are definitely in person and okay. we just very recently became mask optional uh, Westchester the area itself has been numbers have been looking great for yep. uh, COVID so yep. yeah um, yeah we are, we are very much in person um, so so Griffin on that on that topic also kind of touching on that a little bit um you know, you mentioned being on the road and kind of traveling and getting to these high schools and, and, and getting in and presenting to a lot of them. Uh, Griffin, do you guys at, at any of the Pashi schools, for the most part, your, your colleagues that you bounce in and out a lot of these webinars and get to meet and, and do a lot of these different things, um, you know, do, do, you, do you find that, are, are you guys Zooming with individual students, uh, you know, individual interviews with students, answering questions with specific, stu specific students through Zoom or anything from that standpoint? What, what does that look like as, a, as an admissions person? Sure. So if we're strictly uh, going for like these virtual visits, um, they can happen in different ways. So there, it could be either a virtual college fair or just a virtual visit where a college fair would be several different schools coming in gotcha. uh, virtually and they can watch me present and I'll give my spiel about Westchester um, and then I'll open it up to questions. Great. So uh, it's, it's pretty much the same thing for a regular just high school visit. Uh, gotcha. if that's virtual and it all depends. So sometimes I'll have 
one or two students show up to a virtual visit. Sometimes yeah. I'll have 34. Yep. So, and uh, depending on the size of the group that I'm with or what have you, sometimes the counselor's in that visit with me and they'll be fielding questions from the students that they're getting on their end for the counselor to talk to me about and I'll be able to answer them directly for them. Or if the counselor's not there and it's just the students, they'll message it in for me um, and I'll see it as I'm presenting and be able to address it as is. Mm -hmm. um, for the in-person visits, um, our students that come in will have a chance to go and see the university with student ambassadors, but we'll have our counselors such as myself um, readily available for either before the tour or even after the tour um, to answer any specific questions that aren't answered on the tour or very person specific. Okay. So while we have people on campus, um, we are there to answer all of these questions. You great. can phone me in, you can have my email. I'm more than happy to connect with you. We can do a one-on-one -on -one interview. No, it's perfect. Uh, so That's any great. of those options are there for these students. Okay, great. Hey, Griffin. Th hey, thanks. Thanks a lot tonight. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, you've been a great resource for us. I know it's not easy. Like I mentioned to the to the rest of the crew earlier, to kind of field some of these questions on behalf of the whole system here. But but I really appreciate it. And, and thanks for joining. And, and you're, what, what a wonderful asset that's right down the road for us. So so thanks again, Griffin. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Bob. Thanks appreciate. for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Hey, listen, everyone. Um, this is the third of our Unionville High School College Webinar Planning, uh, College Planning Webinar Series. Um, so if you can, everyone, if you don't mind in the chat right now, there is the link to our feedback, uh, our, our feedback here uh, for the um, webinars, um, in particular tonight. Um, please click on that link. Please fill it out. Um, we always love hearing feedback from the community on how we can improve things or make adjustments uh, to these webinars. Um, again, this webinar is recorded. We will post it within the next week on our Counseling Center webpage. I highly, highly, highly encourage everyone out there to please visit the Unionville High School School Counseling website. Um, we spent years putting it together. Um, and uh, in particular, related to this field and this topic, uh, please click on the college planning portion of things. Uh, we have a ton of information there uh, that covers all the different topics from our webinars, let alone we actually have our recorded webinar stored there too. Um, so again, thank you to uh, Justin Webb um, for our technology portion of things. Uh, wonderful job, Justin, e each time we do one of these, just so impressed. Uh, thank you again to our presenters tonight. Um, you know, Griffin Jackson from Westchester University, uh, Commander David Augustine, um, you know, from the Naval, uh, from the Navy, and um, also Tom Kovic from uh, uh, Victory Athletic Recruiting uh, to be able to help us out tonight on the different topics. Um, again, uh, the, these uh, questions we had come in throughout the course of the night. We really appreciate the community participating. And as we move forward, um, please feel free to uh, ask your uh, child's counselor if you have any questions or anything else. Um, thank you again for allowing us to participate with these webinars, and we really appreciate it. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.